Hi, my name is Callie Chappelle, and welcome to this video about the t-test and ANOVA. This video is made for Bio 47, Introduction to Research in Ecology and Evolution at Stanford University, and was taught spring of 2020. So just to review, last week we talked about linear regression, and this week we're going to focus on ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. Both linear and regression and ANOVA use the LM function in R, and just to give you a reminder, the, the syntax for the LM function is y tilde x, and then define the data that you're using. So in linear regression, remember we were comparing two continuous variables. So you'd have your x and y, your x and y continuous variables in the LM function. But in ANOVA, we compare a continuous variable as our dependent response to a categorical independent predictor. So in this case, we're going to nectar pH as our continuous dependent response, our Y, and treatment factor, which in our case would be the bagged, exposed, and cage flowers would be our independent predictor. So I'm going to give you a brief aside about the t-test um, just to get us thinking about ANOVA. And so the fundamental question that we would use is how different are two groups? And so the t-test, or sometimes called the student's t-test, was named after the seminal paper by student. Now student was actually William Gossett, who was a worker at the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland, fun fact. And he was very interested in testing differences between groups with small sample sizes, thinking about hops and things like that. And Guinness wanted to publish his results anonymously without alerting competitors of their new statistics, so he actually published the paper anonymously under the name student. So you can think about this through my little diagram here where you have two different, we have a categorical variable with two groups, group A and group B, and they, and they're, you're measuring some continuous variable. So you want to know, are these different? These are just box plots. So you can have your box plots and the box plots are made up of all the individual data points, right? All your individual observations. And so if you think about, for example, just group A, you can think about the distribution of those observations where you have your continuous variable. So I'm just flipping the Y was on the on this axis and now it's down here. And you can measure the frequency of each observation so you get some distribution. And that distribution has a mean. And so what we're doing when we do a t-test or when we do an ANOVA is comparing the means of the two different groups um, and against the of the continuous variable of different groups and asking are those means significantly different from each other so for example you might ask um, does pollination affect nectar ph and so we can ask a specific question do flowers with open or closed stigmas so our a closed stigma represents a pollinated flower or we think is a good proxy for pollination and an open stigma represents an unpollinated flower do those two groups differ in their nectar ph so we might develop a hypothesis that says something like flowers with open versus closed stigmas will differ in their nectar pH. And so what we can do is we can plot flowers where these are just all the uh, data, raw data points. We can plot flowers with open and closed stigma. So here, so here's a flower with an open stigma that had a nectar pH of a little over six. Here's a flower that we observed that had a closed stigma that also had a similar nectar pH. And so we can plot these two and we can overlay the individual observations of box plot because that's something that we're a little bit used, more used to seeing. I just included the code down here in case you wanted to generate that yourself. So if we just look at the box plot only, we can ask how different are these two groups. Now just a brief aside about bar plots versus box plots. So you can use either bar plots or box plots to visualize differences in groups against a continuous variable. In bar plots, the top of the bar represents the mean and these error bars represent standard deviations. Where in a box plot, you actually see the median, so the thick line represents the median and the other points represent the quartiles. So personally, I prefer box plots. This was a really great meme that I got from one of the other uh, instructors, Dr. Miller. Uh, and I personally prefer box plots because in bar plots, you lose all the variation down here where because the bar goes all the way to zero, where you can actually see that variation in box plots. Sorry, Dr. Scape. Dr. Scape prefers bar plots. So moving on to ANOVA, so we learned about kind of some intuition about how we can compare two different groups um, and we are measuring a continuous variable, but what if you have more than two comparisons? So in our uh, class, we've been measuring uh, different nectar parameters and nectar microbial communities in three different treatments. Flowers that are just exposed to the air and pollinators, flowers that are 
inside of bags or plants or that are inside of cages, excuse me, that exclude pollinators, large pollinators, and uh, flowers that are bagged to exclude all pollinators. And so you can think about these differences in the different treatments as uh, excluding different dispersal vectors of microbes like pollinators. So exposed flowers have access to all pollinators. Caged flowers um, are excluding birds only, which are the main pollinators of uh, Mimulus or Diplicus or Antiochus. And the bagged flowers, there's no pollinators allowed, or so we hope. So you use ANOVA or analysis of variance when you have multiple predictor categories or more than two. So for example, if our big question again is does pollination affect nectar pH, we could have a specific question that, um, for example, instead of looking at open or closed stigmas, we could ask do pollinate or do flowers with different levels of pollination through the our three pollinator exclusion treatments differ in their nectar pH? So our hypothesis would be that flowers um, uh, that have different pollination exclusion treatments, so exposed, bagged, or caged, will differ in their nectar pH. And indeed, that's what we looked at in our examples.r um, example with the uh, one-way ANOVA. So I'm not going to go through that code with you now. Um, maybe I will in a, at the end of this video, but I'm going to move on to comparing one and two-way ANOVA. So one-way ANOVA is when you have one factor or one independent variable, and two-way ANOVA is when you have two factors or two independent variables, and you want to know what is the relative contribution or the differences in each individual independent variable and their interaction to the continuous variable of interest. So for example, um, just to go through our, our example again, um, in our one-way ANOVA, we compared nectar pH, how nectar pH differed between the exposed, caged, and bagged treatments. So our, uh, our Y is nectar pH and our X is the treatment, right? Um, and in a two-way ANOVA, you can compare multiple independent variables. So in our case, the Y is still nectar pH, but we're comparing treatment, so exposed, caged, and bagged again, but by stigma, open or closed. So we've got, we're comparing both the stigma status and the treatment all in one in that two-way ANOVA. So how does ANOVA work under the hood? We don't need to get into this too much, but just to give you some general intuition, the value that we um, kind of use to compare groups is what we call the F ratio. So for example, if we're comparing number of flowers in two different conditions, shade or sun, I know this is a two instead of a three, because so you could think about this like a t-test, but we're, I'm just doing this for the purpose of simplifying things. So in our shade treatment, we've got plants with various number of flowers with a mean of this dotted red line. And in sun, we also have plants that have these various numbers of flowers and the mean is this green line. So we can create an F ratio, we can calculate an F ratio where we look at the differences among groups versus within groups. And so low F values mean that groups are more similar, whereas high F values, groups are more different. So we can use the F value um, to ask the question, what is the probability of getting this F value if there actually is no difference in mean? So if we want to know, does X affect Y, we can calculate a p-value, which in this case represents the probability of a value if f is no difference, if f is uh, if a value greater than f, if there's actually no difference in means. And we can look at our square, which um, we're not actually going to be asking you to calculate for ANOVA generally, to ask if x is a good predictor of y. So again, just like linear regression, it's the proportion of total variance accounted for among groups. But our square is not uh, part of the standard ANOVA output. Now a couple of follow-up questions. So the p-value from a ANOVA will just say if there's a difference between groups, but it doesn't tell you if the difference is uh, which groups are different. Maybe all of them are different, maybe only some of them are different. And so we need to use what we call a post hoc test in order to know which groups are actually different. And I know it's very easy to call it tricky. This was uh, Dr. Miller again found this fantastic thing, but I always thought about this too. So Tukey sounds like turkey, and there are actually scientific papers where they wrote turkey, but it is Tukey. So the Tukey post hoc test tells you which groups are significantly different. So our ANOVA p-value, so this is just an example that are, you get an overall p-value from just running the ANOVA. So this is what we just talked about. Um, and that tells you if any group is different from another. But then you need to do a post hoc test to say which groups are significantly different. So that's this Tukey HSD test of uh, the ANOVA. 
And so these p-values say, does cage and expose differ? Does bagged and exposed differ? Does bagged and cage differ? And so based on those post hoc results, you can add significant codes to plots. Now, I know we talked about this last week, but just to reiterate, um, we can use different letters above here, A, B, B in this case, to represent which groups are different. So groups that are significantly different that we can determine from the post hoc test will have different letters above them. So the fact that this exposed has A and this caged has B means that exposed and caged are significantly different. And as you can see here, caged exposed, that is significantly different. Uh, exposed and bagged also have two different letters, A and B, so that means that bagged and exposed must be significantly different, and indeed they are. But caged and bagged, as you can see, have the same letter, so that means that they are not significantly different. And if you look at the p-value, you can see that as well. So by looking at these values, you can put these letters on top of the groups that provide a lot more information or just a little bit more intuitive than looking at a table of values. Now, the last thing I want to talk about with ANOVA is the assumptions of the model. So there's two main assumptions of ANOVA. The first is that the data is normally distributed. Um, so the way that we can determine that is by making a histogram of the frequency of all of the, of the values of the continuous variable. And you can see this is the code to generate this histogram. And you can see that this looks pretty normally distributed. It's not skewed in one direction or the other. The second is that the data is homoscedastic, which means that there's equal variances between groups. Now, in order to test that, we use a Bartlett test. And if the p-value of the Bartlett test is greater than 0.05, we can say that the, there are equal variances between groups, or to be more specific, we cannot reject the, the null hypothesis that there are not. So you can use this Bartlett test function in R in order to test that. Now, what values do you report? So for both, you need to report your overall model p-value and then the QG post hoc test. But what does that mean in the context of a two-way ANOVA? So a two-way ANOVA is going to give you also an overall model p-value that tells you if the groups differ in their response. But it's a little bit more complicated to try to understand what that means. So when we look at the uh, results from the two-way ANOVA, you'll get two different p-values for each of the models for an ANOVA with each of the two independent variables of treatment and the stigma separately, and then one that's an interactive term between them. So in this case, the only significant p-value is for treatment factor. So that says that the groups differ in their treatment, but they don't differ based on stigma, and they don't differ on the interaction between the two. And so if I got something like this, what I would want to result in my what I would want to interpret in my 2P postdoc tests, and of course you'd want to state this, that you were doing this explicitly, would be to run this model again with two key labels and say, okay, this is the only, the um, treatments dif or the groups differed in treatment, and so which groups differed in treatment. So you could run the 2P postdoc test with just this model like we did with the one-way ANOVA. So I just wanted to clarify that. Now, the last thing to mention is about transformations. So again, I mentioned that one of the assumptions was of, normal, of normality. So an assumption of parametric statistics generally is that you have normally distributed residuals. And in practice, this is usually best achieved if the response variable is normally distributed. So what we can do is transform the data, which is a mathematical process that changes the values of the data without affecting their rank order. So for example, this is just a funny meme that, that Dr. Miller also found. Dr. Miller knows how to find memes where you're saying, why can't you just be normal to your data? So uh, this would be an example of data that's not normally distributed. And so what we can do is we can squeeze the data over to try to make it more normally distributed, kind of like how you might drive a tire over some toothpaste. So what we can do is we can transform the data by, for example, log transforming it. So taking the log 10 of it and transform this skewed data that's not normal to data that looks much more normally distributed. So a good practice before starting your analyses is to screen your variables for normality, especially your response variables. And you can do that by using histograms. If they are skewed, you can see if a transformation improves them to make them look more normal. So some Common examples are the natural log, log 10, square root, but there's many other possibilities. And of course, you need to report if you are doing a transformation, and that would need to be represented in how you, what you say about the y-axis, right? 
You can also use different statistical approaches, such as generalized models that use other underlying distributions, for example, um, like in logistic aggression, but we'll be talking about that later. But unless it's required, transformations are oftentimes easier. Now, we saw an example of this in our week three pre-lecture, where we started out with uh, data like this. This is our bacterial CFU permiculator. And after taking the log 10, we get a much more normally distributed data. However, we do have a lot of zeros. So that's something to consider about this data set and perhaps could be the reason why, if you think back to this pre-lecture, we actually failed the Bartlett test. So just to remind you, we've talked about linear regression. We just talked about ANOVA. Um, these are two tests that have continuous dependent responses. And in the next few videos, I'll be talking about the chi-square test and the logistic regression.